Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second webinar of our international e-commerce series. My name is Gemma Price, and I'm the Content and Community Manager at Open to Export. Uh, for those of you that are new to our webinars, Open to Export is a free online community where UK businesses and organisations come together to help each other become better, smarter, and more confident doing business abroad. Um, we are proud to be supported by our founding partners, the UK Trade and Investment, the Institute of Export, the Federation of Small Businesses, and Haibu. If you haven't already, please do pop along to opentoexport.com and take a look at our international e-commerce feature page, which is packed full of case studies, articles, discussions, and videos to help you grow your business internationally online. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is the second in our series, so if you missed the first one, you can catch up on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash open to export, and you can watch back all of our previous webinars and all of our previous feature series on there as well. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we kick off the main part of the session. So our scheduled runtime is one hour, um, and we should kind of finish the main session at half past three. So if you've been selected to take part in our mentoring session at the end, please just do stay on the call. With regards to interacting with us, you can post your question to our speakers and case studies using the question box in your control panel, which should be appearing on the right-hand side of your screens. Um, now, we do historically get a lot of questions coming through, so we'll try to get to as many of the questions as possible. But if you don't manage to get to yours, please do log on to opentoexport.com and post your question on our discussion forum so the community can give you a personalised response. Mm. Um, so just while we're waiting for the final few attendees to join, I'm going to run a quick poll, um, which should be coming up on your screens now. So um, the poll just gives us an idea of how you currently attract uh, your international inquiries. So if you could pick um, the most relevant, appropriate option uh, for your business. So, which online channel is most effective for you when you attract international customers? So I'll just leave the poll running on your screens for a quick moment while the last few people join and introduce our expert speaker and chair for today's session, Sarah Carroll. Uh, Sarah founded Grow Global, which is a, a consultancy helping companies find new channels to international markets online. Uh, Sarah is a regular speaker of ours and UK Trade Investment um, on the subject of international websites, international e-commerce, and global social media. Um, Sarah's also lived and worked internationally, so she's really well placed to discuss this topic, um, working um, multilingually uh, with teams for global management consultancies. So I'm just going to close the poll, um, and as predicted, as, as I thought, 55% of you uh, use websites as your, your main way um, of attracting new customers online. 16% of you uh, uh, find social media quite effective, and 14% of you on email marketing. Uh, so with those results then, let's get started. Uh, Sarah, I'll hand over to you to take it from here. Are you there with us? Thank you very much, Gemma. Well, before we start um, with our panel, um, let's have a bit of a think about why we should export online in the first place. Um, if we go back to basics, there are about 7 billion people in the world, and many of those are in countries that can actually afford and might well want your products and services, especially at the moment with brands Britain riding very high. By selling through the web and carrying out digital marketing, we have an amazing opportunity to reach customers beyond the borders of just the UK. And here's a few facts and figures for you. 70% of online search inquiries are not actually in English, according to Open Multilingual. And 90% of European internet users visit websites in their own language, according to an EU study. And you may have heard this one before. This is the most well-quoted one, but it says customers are four times more likely to buy from a website if it is in their um, own language and that was from IDC. Now we know and we probably read in the press that uh, online retail is growing by up to 20% in the UK at the moment and it's fast outpacing the growth rate of the whole economy. So in the UK, we're actually one of the most advanced e-commerce markets in the world. So if we get it right here first, then we're gonna be really, really well positioned to compete online in other markets around the world. And there really is a whole world of opportunity out there as cross-border online trade is predicted to increase sevenfold by 2020, 
according to a study by Google and OCNC. In that same report, although Google says it is important to acknowledge and manage some of the complexities of trading internationally online, things like selling in different currencies, managing translation, as well as the practicalities of shipping goods around the globe. So today we've got three companies with us, as Gemma said, who've already started off on this journey to take advantage of uh, the opportunity that awaits us for exporting online. Um, we'll find out uh, what's worked well for them and also, you know, very realistically, what was just a little bit more difficult. First of all, we've got Neve Barker from the Travel Wrap Company who sells the most beautiful cashmere wraps and who recently started selling internationally online. Next, we've got Anne-Marie Morrison from Labels for Kids and they've been selling their handy naming kits uh, for children stuff online for a, a little bit longer than their needs but they have as, it, as she says and it's fair to say had to jump through a few hurdles to actually get to where she is today with her exporting online and uh, we also have neil seymour from challenge trophy who sells trophies for sport clubs across europe and he's learned some of the early lessons of exporting online is now really getting the hang of it um, and getting some real growth in export sales so let's go on and let's find out how they've each gone about exporting online. So would you like um, to introduce um, yourself first, Neve? Hi, Sarah. Um, yeah, no, I'm Neve Barker. I'm the managing director of the Travel Wrap Company. Um, and we sell, as Sarah said, we sell um, Scottish cashmere um, wraps and accessories. Um, we sell our three main revenue streams are online, um, retail, we sell into retail. A lot of the growth recently is export and um, we sell online internationally. Um, we also sell to corporates. We do a lot of spoke gifting um, and that sort of thing with our travel apps. We won international but our luxury gift of the year a couple of years back, so that, that helped with that. That's brilliant, thank you. And um, how about Amory? Can you introduce your labels for kids and what you're doing internationally? Yeah, <laughs> you're really losing my voice already. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Anne-Marie Morris and Labels for Kids. Um, we've been operating for 10 years and we've been selling um, online, mostly in the UK initially, but really for, from about three or four years in, we started to get a lot more orders internationally. So um, we decided to go global by setting up websites in other countries. We have Spain, France, Sweden, Germany, um, are live and we're about for Portugal and Italy live and the US as well, a localized one for the US. So um, it's been a, a long and arduous journey, I would say. It hasn't been easy, um, but we're getting there and we now think it's going to be quite a good year this year for us. But uh, I think the, the problem with the economy hasn't helped internationally. So uh, we're getting there. We've done well. We've won online retailer of the year for the last five years, which has been good in the children's category in the online retail awards. And um, yeah, we think we're, we think we're getting there at last, but it, it's not been an easy journey. Thank you. And how about Neil? Can you tell us a little bit about Challenge Trophies and what you've been doing um, online and internationally? Certainly, Sarah. Yeah, um, just to introduce myself. I'm Neil Seymour, the uh, managing director of Challenge Trophies. Uh, we've been retailing sports trophies and awards for, uh, for over 35 years now. Um, back in 2007, we, we took what seemed like a pretty bold step back then to move away from high street retailing. Uh, we, we closed the shops in the warehouse and uh, we outsourced production and became a, uh, a pure online retailer. Uh, since, since that time, we've uh, grown pretty rapidly within the UK, uh, sort of reasserting ourselves amongst the leading suppliers. Um, and then we've, we've, we've taken it to Europe, um, setting up dedicated sites into uh, Germany, uh, in France, uh, Netherlands um, and Sweden. So we've been working in, in those places for a little while now and um, beginning to beginning to slowly but uh, surely get the uh, hang of what we're trying to do there. Yeah, that sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, and coming back to both, you know, Amory and uh, Neil, we'll go to Amory first. Um, how did you first start selling internationally? Uh, it was accidental, were you saying? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not the accidental tourist, I'm the accidental exporter, I think. Um, we, we just started to get uh, orders from as far away as Australia, uh, China, even, um, actually even the White House in Washington as well, um, and Germany. But we noticed that we were getting more orders from Germany of, out of all of these places. We did approach UKTI to get the research done to check where they think the, the label market would be 
um, would, would have an, a gap in the market, I guess, and, and the Northern Europe was identified as being a target area, Germany and Sweden in particular. Um, and we decided that because there was more orders coming from Germany, then Sweden probably, and then France, that Germany would be the right place to start um, targeting, doing our, our localization of our website. Brilliant. No, that sounds like a very planned approach to, to the whole thing. And how about you, Neil? Because you've chosen some of the similar markets, actually, to Anne-Marie. Yeah, I, w I wouldn't say um, our approach is quite so planned. Um, I somewhat stumbled into it a little bit. Like, like, um, like Anne-Marie, uh, I started receiving some export orders, and um, particularly in the, in the early days from Germany. Um, and it, it kind of got me thinking about how competitive uh, the battle for organic rankings was uh, within the UK. And just questioned myself whether it would be uh, easier in other countries. So I started doing some pretty primitive uh, research on uh, Google.de to, to have a look at our, um, our competition. And, and when I did that, I thought, well, you know, you know, we, we could we could okay there. Let, you know, let's give this a go. So I made the decision based on on, on that hunch. I and mean, in truth, um, that that whole process was fairly flawed because the search search terms that I was researching were probably not the ones that the uh, the German people were were actually using. So if I'd have used some different terms, I may have uh, realised it's a lot more competitive and uh, may not have taken the decision. But I'm I'm glad I took the decision, no matter uh, how incorrectly I arrived at. That is absolutely brilliant. That's, a, like, that's a quite a good story as well, isn't it, about uh, choosing the right keywords as well. And how about you, uh, Neve? Did you did you fall into exporting online? We we do, and um, we we have done, and we've we've um, we still do quite a lot of work with UKTIs. We do a lot of the um, uh, international showcases in the embassy. I've done a couple of trade missions this year, and we realized or I realized that we had quite a high um just a potential for our product for um exporting so wholesale exporting rather than direct sales so it was kind of the other way around a bit they really like our Britishness abroad if you talk about the, mm -hmm. the British label and you know from as far away as Japan we now get online orders um the US Germany is our biggest audience but like Amory that's where they sell best and that's what we tend to target um, so we kind of did the other way around. We we, we looked at our wholesale potential abroad and then just started um, building up parallel websites and the website started selling direct. But I think we're we're still early days in our journey. Yeah, <laughs> and I it, think that's exactly. it. Very hard work. I mean, it, it is hard work sometimes. Yeah, no, exactly. That's what we're talking about the complexities of it, isn't it? And, and um, Neil, what approach have you taken to you know finding customers uh, while you've been uh, exporting online? Have you used marketplaces, or you've obviously mentioned your website? Have you taken yeah, any I other mean, approaches? Well, I mean, uh, I haven't used marketplaces so much. Um, with ours being personalised products, it didn't really feel that that was a great fit. Um, I initially, again, another decision which uh, I probably would <laughs> regret right now. My first avenue was to set up the dedicated sites for for each country, but uh, to use AdWords to drive traffic there, which um, in, in the early stages of developing a site uh, in another country, it's a pretty foolish way to go about it because you're going to spend a lot of money um, to attract uh, traffic and, and it's going to take a while for, for you to evolve and to learn about that particular country and get the website right. So you're going to get um, visitors there who, who probably uh, you know, won't want to buy once they get there. So that was a, a relatively exp uh, expensive lesson which, uh, which I learned. Um, since then, we've tried pretty much uh, every approach and I think um, you learn from each one and, and, and that helps you when you, when you go into the, uh, into the next country. Yeah, and do you think each market's different, or each country that you're trying to target is different, or is there yeah. a similar pattern? No, I think I do think they all have um, many differences. Again, uh, it may be through such things like payment options, or, or, or just their approach to, to buying abroad. Um, so yeah, I've learned I've learned di different lessons uh, in each country, but some of those will apply across uh, you know across all, all new ventures. But yeah, they're definitely different. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. And how about you, uh, Neve? How what routes have you taken to markets uh, online? Um, well, we uh, online we've got well we've got our um, own language websites now, so we've got those in place. We've got um, three different currencies people can transact in. We just keep trying to remove barriers to different mm -hmm. countries. For example, mm -hmm. in um, America, I mean I don't know if anybody else has this, this experience, but um, we discovered a lot of Americans only have Amex, so they don't use other credit cards. And we resisted using Amex to start with, um, just because it was going to cost us so much. Um, but we now do 
we do have um, facility for our customers to use Emex because we find a lot of the Americans will only use Emex, maybe at, maybe at a, a higher level. I mean, our, our price point is quite high. Um, so that was one of the price. We just keep, I mean, just learning through our customer experiences and keep removing those barriers as we go. The other thing we did, which helps enormously, is the girl who is our agent in Germany um, also does some PR and marketing for us on the ground. So we were in German Cosmopolitan last month, for example. She, she speaks to bloggers in German and gets them to talk about us in German, obviously, on, on the, the, the social media out there. So that, that I think, works very well. So Germany, Germany is one of our biggest um, audiences at the moment I, I think you've got to have the, the kind of media presence on the ground as well as as well as just the, the um, e-marketing and social media I, I, yes. I think you've, um, you make some uh, some excellent points I do believe that part of this process that I've found is definitely exactly what, what you say there about breaking down barriers and uh, when you go into the new com uh, countries it's finding you know their, their payment preferences uh, as you would know in Germany that don't really favour debit and credit cards too much and again across to Sweden and further than pay by invoice and you've got to learn these lessons but it's always sort of each barrier that you, you, you eventually realise that that's preventing us from selling there and, and what do I need to do and I need to increase my payment options, I need to translate more of the site, I need to have local people to hand and I think that's how it works, you know. Yeah, no, yeah. I agree. I think that's great. And how about you, Anne-Marie? Have uh, you used a combination of online and offline to tackle new markets? Yeah, I agree with both, both one of the, um, the other two have said well, basically translation was a big issue as well, making sure you've got, um, you know, because people, people recommend translation companies, but there's translation companies out there that are good at it, and there's translation companies that are not so good at it. Um, and it needs to be specialist e-commerce translation companies if you're going to go that route. Um, and I would make sure that you, you've checked a few of the sites that they've done and both got some references. Um, we've tried both routes. We've tried native speakers to translate the site, and we've tried translation companies. And actually, the native speakers who we've had in as staff who were actually students from the universities worked out better for the translation than the translation companies. Um, although, and uh, we've had a couple of cases where they've said they've been native speakers and in actual fact haven't done as well because it turns out that they're married to a native speaker and lived in the country but were not, not as efficient as they said they have been and we've had to have it done again as well. So um, it's, it's been a, that's been a difficult one and things like removing barriers to payments was a massive thing, trying to find out which bank to go with and who could offer all of the different um, methods of payment in each country um, was a big hurdle initially and really that held us back quite a few years I think. Um, like Neil we've done AdWords as well and I think that works quite well but it is an expensive route but it does get you, uh, does um, help get you back up to page one if you've optimised your state site well and then you do some AdWords at the same time. It makes, it gets you a bit more exposure than being on page 10 or 20 in that country as long as you've got your keywords and the main optimization and translation of your site right as well. Um, and we've done blogging and social media as well, but to a lesser extent. Yeah, no. It's sounding to me that it's not like one thing necessarily that you have to do. It sounds like it's a whole combination yeah, of different yeah. things to actually get you to where you are. Having said that, what, what would you think the one uh, adaptation you had to make your online presence would have been, the thing that really made the most difference? I think currency or payment ooh, method? or The payment method, definitely. Well, the translation and then the payment method. Yeah. Own, own language, yeah. yeah. You'd, you'd agree with that, Neve? I would, yeah. I think I think Amory's right. Yeah, no, it, it, it's got to be own language. You quoted a statistic in your introduction, Sarah, about it being four times more likely for them to buy in their own language customers, and I that's very true in our experience. Mm -hmm. And getting that mm -hmm. right, and also getting somebody. I mean, we've got somebody now in Germany who we've got on our German site who will do customer service stuff, which is one less barrier again to yeah, buy out there. They know there's somebody there to answer inquiries. And I think yeah. people, too, they talk about Google Translate, but actually you know it yourself, if you take any foreign language website and you translate it through Google Translate to get the English, that's pretty much what they're going to get at the other end, and you're not really going to buy from somebody in <laughs> France or Germany if that's, you can't understand their English. Exactly. We did, we exactly. did the Google Translate thing to start, and it was, uh, it's like, oh, it's just a joke, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> We've tried that as well, yeah. It's bad. I think everybody's done that. Yeah. It's a, it's a starting point, isn't it? At least you're thinking about going international with you to start with Google <laughs> Translate. And how about you, Neil? What would you say was sort of like the, the one or two uh, bigger things that have made a difference that you've had to uh, yeah. change? 
Uh, Anne Marie and Neva have hit the nail on the head. I mean, certainly it's uh, the translations and the payment gateways. I mean, uh, the payment methods. I mean, you know, you, you can instantly lose so 30 or 40 percent of your prospective clients by the fact that you don't offer uh, the method they want to pay in. But with, with the translation, it, it, it's a very, very big decision when you, you're going down this road. And, and uh, Amory's uh, done many of the same things by the sound of things that, uh, that we have. Uh, we've employed uh, translation companies. I haven't been massively impressed with them. I think uh, the key, if you can find it, is uh, to, to find a good uh, local speaker who understands the e-commerce wor uh, world. That's, that's uh, certainly important. Um, they do take a different approach to it. Um, but uh, there are plenty available, and, and we've been lucky enough to, to find some uh, within the UK have been a, a massive help to us. Um, they're available then uh, to, to perform that customer, uh, the customer service function for you. Uh, but also, I found them... Um, we're really willing to help and to, to uh, touch base with their contacts uh, back in, uh, in in the homeland and, and mm -hmm. try and work uh, work for opportunities for us. And, and, and with uh, you know the strongest uh, suit that we have now is is the, those guys that uh, that work for us on, on pretty much a freelance basis. But there's some really good ones there, and, and it brings the cost down uh, enormously um, and, and makes it a lot more viable to try uh, to try try new territory. So uh, that's the key. If you can find um, some, some good translators uh, in the UK. Uh, and it will be there. Um, uh, you know, that, that will be a great springboard for it. That sounds good advice, very good advice. And then moving on, thinking about, um, I think, Need, you said that you were selling in different currencies. Um, how did you go about setting that up? Because that can be a bit tricky too, can't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean, the, the kind of from one country? You're selling in, in euros, in dollars, yeah. uh, and, and, or not to in yeah. and whether or not to charge people VAT. I mean, that was yeah. the other thing. Yeah. We are still stressing quite early on in this and we've 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 done both we've you know we've added VAT in and included everything and then we've taken it off because some customers that's another barrier to to them buying um in terms of setting up technically the, the kind of different currencies um I, I I handed all that over to our web people Sarah I want to say I didn't have much to do with that and so, so you display in the, the different currencies. Do you accept payment in all the di three different currencies as well? Yeah, we do. So we've got three you different do. kinds of dollars and, yeah. and, and euros and pounds. Yeah. Yeah. And how about you, Anne-Marie? Do you sell in multiple currencies? We do, but we don't have three different bank accounts. We kept the pounds account because of the for small businesses, the cost of keeping the, the accounts in each currency is quite prohibitive. Um, what we've done is set up different merchant accounts through WorldPay. And then the merchant, obviously the customer completes in their own, in their own payment method through the WorldPay system and in their own currency. But then it's, we obviously take the hit then of having it converted to pounds to put back in our bank account. So, um, but that's the cheapest way for us to run it on an ongoing basis to keep down the monthly, the monthly charges. Yeah, no, that sounds like a good plan. Yeah. And how about you, Neil? Are you selling in multiple currencies? Yeah, yes, we are, yeah. Um, we initially set up the uh, different merchant accounts to, to handle different currencies. Um, but uh, similar to Anne-Marie there, we, we now, we've recently switched uh, to uh, Skrill who, who offer a lot of uh, different payment options. Uh, I would think they've still got a little bit of work to do on, uh, on, on their gateway and how it appears to, to the customer. But again, everything, to, uh, we take the hit like Anne-Marie and everything gets converted back into to Sterling. But uh, yeah, you, you do need to do it. I mean, we, we tried uh, launching in Sweden just accepting payments in, uh, in euros and uh, they you know, they didn't seem to want to buy, so, you know, we had to introduce the corona there. Maybe it was the trophies they didn't like, I don't know, but uh, they, didn't seem to, uh, they didn't seem to want to buy. So, uh, yeah, we made the change to, to corona there, and it's, it's been better since. So uh, I think you need to do it. And, again, how you display the prices, you, know, you don't really um, show the decimal point as we do in the UK, and it's little things like that, um, which are mistakes that, that we made in the past that are simple things to rectify, but you just need to be aware of it. Yeah, exactly. It's well worth doing the research into each country, isn't it, before you um, before you start launching your website. Now, we've talked a lot about the websites and the currencies and uh, payment gateways, but what else do you do online to keep uh, consumers engaged with your brand? Do you use social media or e-marketing? Um, yeah, we uh, use both. Well, I was just going to say we use both, very simply, Sarah. So um, we, and we, we segment our um, email 
um, data as well. So we can, you know, we can divide it up into, well, very crudely, but we can, we know that there's a certain section that is American data and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of target an email to that data. Um, and we do lots of social media, um, blogging and email marketing. Yeah. What social media platforms are you on? Um, just the basics, <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. Yeah. And th those are all working for you. Well, that's enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do you have international visitors, you know, coming on there and interacting with you, or are they mostly UK based? No, we do get international. We get we love German because we get we get mentioned in German blogs and things. So and we get so we we post, for example, this week we posted a picture on Facebook of some German customers wearing our travel wraps in a German shop that we sell to. Um, <laughs> so we do, we do quite a lot of international stuff. Brilliant. Okay. How about you, Anne Marie? Do you use social media and yeah. email marketing? We we do both. Um, email marketing has been less successful for us, I would say. Um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm a bit. I, what I feel with email marketing, I think I think it's necessary, but I think it has to be targeted well. And a lot of the the systems that you use that do more like a capture system where, you know, if you, if you do this, then that happens, or if you do this, then you get that email, and you get different emails for different things that happen. Um, that would be the best way to target it, you know, like you get a drop out of basket, abandoned basket email, um, mm. or if they buy still on labels, for example, they might get a vinyl label email. Um, things like that is what we're trying to do, and we've just moved, we've just moved provider for email marketing again. Um, we've been struggling to find one that's a really good cost that can be flexible enough for us, but we've now found one that thinks well with Magento, which is the system we're on for retail. So that should work well, but it, it's good. It's not, it hasn't been good for encouraging new customers, but it's been good for keeping the current customers informed, I guess. Um, yeah. So we use that, but we're also on tons of things, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, YouTube, Flickr. Um, we use them all pretty actively. And they work well, Facebook, but because of our market, I think because it's uh, mostly parents that buy from us of, you know, sort of middle income to higher income parents and they, yeah. they're on Facebook and twi Twitter as well, bizarrely, and they like, so the women think like Pinterest. Yeah. So you've got the full range there, that's very active on social yeah. media. And how about and you, Neil? social media does work well, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's your, that's your that's nice there, isn't it, Amory? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, How ourselves, you, yeah, we, we, we've initially really concentrated on the uh, email marketing side of things. It, it worked pretty well for us in the UK uh, with the nature of the product being a, an occasional purchase and a fairly niche thing. As long as we've done a, uh, a fairly good job uh, initially, we hope that just by keeping the name in front of them that uh, we'll encourage enough uh, returning customers. We, we have been slow adopters for, uh, on the social media side of things uh, internationally, but we, you know, we're certainly now pushing forward with, with all of those uh, all those things and again utilizing the uh, local speakers we have um, within the UK um, to, to help us with that and uh, yeah we're, we're, we're just taking it up but we're, it's, it's baby steps for us uh, on that side of things. Yeah there's a lot to do isn't there so one step at a time yeah. and doing things doing things well is the best approach isn't it as you're, as you're going through there. And um, if we're thinking about now, we've talked a little bit about the payment, but uh, is there anything else you've had to change in your business to, to cater for international, sort of even post-transaction, getting the actual order in, like a fulfillment, customer support? How about you, Anne-Marie? Yeah, that's horrendous problem for us, the fulfillment. Uh, fulfillment is still a massive problem for us. and, a, and a, because the item, like with Neil, because the item is personalised and they expect an Amazon type of response, next day response, and even if you put massive uh, warning signs at the checkout saying, you know, special delivery or international sign does not mean speed up production, we still have to make this to order. Um, if they don't read, they don't read it. They just scan the website, click it quickly, and off they go, and they expect they'll have it tomorrow. Um, and so getting fulfillment to each country quick enough has been a big problem and we can't just keep it in a warehouse and use somebody like Shuffle and get it from warehouse to the customer in 90 minutes. Um, so we're still working on that. We still provide it all from the UK. And uh, like Neil, I think, was talking about, and also um, Neve, we're, we're looking to get local partners that we can work with, but at the same time, we want to build the business up big enough to be able to afford to do that first. Yeah. 
Exactly, it's part of the journey, isn't it, that you're you're going on then? Yeah, and, and even the uni? localization. Sorry, Amanda. Even the yeah, localization of the site is a problem, and and just getting a trust mark that's that's useful that people recognise in each country. They're all different as well. Yeah. Okay, but those are good, the good tips to look at. How about you, Neil? Have you um, had to change the way that you work within your company to cater for international sales? Well, yes, certainly. First and foremost, uh, creating the extra time that uh, you know, some aspects of this are fairly time consuming. But yeah, you, you, you've got to change um, uh, aspects of your accounting, certainly. Um, when, when we're dealing in, in a few currencies and Again, the guys touched on the whole VAT issue, and you've got the different thresholds in the in the different um, countries. So you, you need to be aware of a lot more. Um, but the fulfilment side is, um, is is difficult because people expect things across the globe these days uh, delivered very quickly. Uh, and if you are personalising them, you really have to make sure that the international orders get dealt with uh, ahead of everything else, so that they're at least on the road uh, a fraction quicker to, to enable to meet uh, people's perception of how quickly something should be delivered in. Um, uh, uh, returns is another thing that uh, we find, we get a lot of questions from uh, from our international customers. They're, they're concerned dealing with um, someone overseas that, uh, you know, what happens if it isn't right? And, uh, and uh, mm. we've been asked that question several times and we've had to adapt really in as much as uh, we, we've taken a, a no, no quibble approach and, and if something's not right, we'll, we'll, we'll get it sent again. We don't want the original one returned to us because we're, we're fairly low cost items. Well, sometimes they are, sometimes they haven't been, but uh, um, yeah, we've had, to, we've had to adapt in those ways. Okay, no, that's all. That's all brilliant advice as well. And how about you, Need? Is there anything you've had to change? We've had to. We don't charge for delivery anywhere in the world, which sometimes costs quite a lot. I mean, we're a very high ticket price item, um, so our um, travel wraps are priced in the UK at two hundred and forty-nine pounds. So we absorb the delivery costs, um, which is we use FedEx International for all our international, so they get there relatively quick. But sometimes it can fortune you know we almost lose all our margin just by kind of delivery um uh but it's it's uh, we've seen the rise in sales when we when we don't charge for delivery and you'll find a lot of a lot of high-end websites don't charge delivery charges either and um, for the us it's fine because fedex american company so it costs us, doesn't cost us very much at all to send to the to the us you know overnight in fact sometimes our priority delivery is is cheaper than the economy um but to send to somewhere like new zealand you know that can be 65 pounds to, to pack and send the travel app over to new zealand it certainly takes a matter of days so our delivery times are always really good and we over we always we always do well in that um so we don't charge for delivery um yeah, no, there's um, the, the telephone thing, communication thing with customers as well. You know, about 60% of mm. our business around Christmas is gifting, and you get people phoning up. They like, they, we offer gift wrapping, and, um, uh, you know, we write notes and everything to people. So, and there's often things people want changed. So we have we have a virtual office, um, which, you know, we, we run 24 hours. So if people want to phone up um, from wherever in the world, on their time scale, they can do that, leave a message, and we'll get back to them. Um, so that's 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 been quite good as well. Um, but there's lots and lots of things to consider. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, you've got Go, go ahead, go ahead, Neil. No, no, I was going to ask Neil, um, with regards to sort of um, the often the free delivery. You said that it made a, a big difference. It's always been my perception that if we did that, it would make a big difference. How marked was it? Um, very marked. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. No, it 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 is. It does make a difference. It's just another barrier, Neil, and it. Yeah. Yeah. It's worked very well. I mean, very you know, the labels the kids were the same. We, we do the free delivery and we just yeah. take the hit on that as well. Because yeah. we we found that customers in France and Germany in particular, they expect a free delivery service. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the deliveries in Germany are so cheap anyway that, uh, compared to the UK. You know, that they, yeah. can, they can ship stuff. It's certainly something we've considered and on the back of that, um, <laughs> I may well be making some changes. <laughs> <laughs> you get your to-do list. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if Neil may have the same problem as us because Neil has a, like you mentioned, you have a high value item, whereas us, you know, 10 to 25 pounds for a pack of labels or something, people don't want to pay 3.99 plus or more for delivery. Um, so we can't really use the courier services. We're, we're sort of stuck using the Royal Mail system. But bizarrely, when we use our, I won't, I won't mention names. We use a courier service, very well known 
um, and they subcontracted it to another courier service and they lost £5,000 worth of, um, of German orders and the German customers were screaming that they, if they had to be posted then they would have had them by now so we can't be, we must be lying. So we had to replace all the orders and just have them all remade and sent out again and we did it with Royal Mail. Um, but the post to Germany can take between, well, between a few days to, to a month and the post to Australia can be there in three days. Mm. Yeah, I can I can sympathise with the problems you're, you're having there, Anne-Marie, because, you know, some of our products, I mean, people can, can buy a lot of trophies, but, you, again, someone may just want a couple. The problem we have uh, is that the post isn't really an option for us because they're always pretty much going to be needed for uh, an event, yeah. a presentation. So we have to take the hit, and we, we try and keep the free delivery uh, threshold as, as low as possible, but it's definitely something that uh, impacts on uh, on sales. And it is a nightmare, and, again, I guess what you would have is if uh, you've sent stuff by post that, uh, you're getting a lot of conversations from the client wondering where they are and, yeah, and you're, you're then using more of your, your translation services. So it's, it's not an easy not an easy problem to deal with. No, it's definitely more a financial margin sort of thing to look yeah. at, I think, for each individual com company because, uh, yeah, you obviously have to make the money on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for, for sure you're going to have some lost leaders, but uh, you don't want too many of them, do you? Right. No. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, we've gone through um, quite a few questions and got some great ideas on how you might want to go international on the web and also be your digital marketing. Um, we're going to have questions in a sec, but before we do that, can we just run through um, probably with me, starting with you, what your biggest challenge you think you've had and then your best bit of advice? <laughs> Tra traffic and sales <laughs> are, are, are the biggest challenges in that in that order. Um, I I think um, maybe our business is slightly different model to everybody else's, but we you know our our wholesale market is our biggest way of exposing a market and testing a market um, overseas. So we find what the the countries in which wholesale works for us, where we're selling into retail. That works online as well, which kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, so that, and also the, I mean, I think the services of UKTI are terrific for this. Um, their OMIS reports, but they do expert reports on a market for you without you having to visit it. You can just brief them in as to what you, what information you want. Um, and some of the um, the showcases, the um, the embassy showcases abroad, and um, the UKTI run are terrific for for you know just putting your toe into a market. Is to go off and do a, a trade show, for example, in a in a country unknown and untested to us is you know thousands and thousands of pounds that we can't afford. Um, but just test the markets in little ways like that. And UK TI have been a terrific tool for us in doing that. That sounds great. And how about you, uh, Anne Marie? Your biggest challenge and your biggest your um, most recommended tip. Oh, so there's a different challenge at each stage of the business growth, mm -hmm. I think. Fulfillment, mm -hmm. I guess, what we were talking about, fulfillment has been our biggest challenge and still remains to be our biggest challenge. Um, and the biggest tip would probably be hire multilingual staff at an earlier stage of the business. Yeah. Um, to have them in house for, for whatever you need, social media translations. But you have to just keep a close eye on them and guide them with what you want to train them up on you know, keywords and optimization and what you want, the way you want it done. So, um, and uh, as Neve says, the, you know, ECR reviews and UKTI are great for that type of thing, for looking at your site and helping with things like that. No, that's absolutely brilliant. And how about you, Neil? Um, I'd say the, the biggest challenges was uh, probably to step back from um, a solely British uh, perspective um, and being a lot more adaptable and flexible and trying to see things from um, uh, from the locals' uh, viewpoint. Uh, cricket trophies wouldn't be that popular in uh, in, in Sweden and uh, we don't sell a lot of ice hockey trophies in the UK. They're little <laughs> things, but uh, you know, having local telephone numbers, all, all those kind of things, just getting back to the fact that uh, there's going to be many barriers and, and trying to... To, to, to view it from uh, non-British eyes, uh, that's that's one of the, the, the things that um, took me a while to, to get my head around. Um, top tip is going back to the, the local speaking uh, translator. It makes a big, big difference to this project. Um, the last site I launched, I launched at approximately about 20 to 25 percent of the cost of the first one I launched, um, and it's been uh, way more successful. 
uh, in, in the very you know from day one, um, from the lessons I've learned from the assistance I had from from the local person. So if you can get that bit right, um, you, you've got uh, a valuable ally, and uh, it will make the whole uh, project a lot easier. Brilliant, brilliant, all good advice. Well, thank you to all three of you for uh, sharing all, all, all the good things and the bad times that you've had and uh, giving advice. Just to summarise a little bit, it seems to be that the opportunity, everybody knows the opportunity is there, but it's not necessarily an easy ride getting there. The theme seems to be that you need to one by one sort of identify the barriers and then break them down, whether that be offering free international delivery, opening up uh, customer support for 24 hours a day, which is... Uh, quite a challenge to do. Uh, avoiding Google Translate seems to come out and then also finding um, very good uh, multilingual staff or uh, translation agencies or freelancers to actually help you produce those multilingual websites and also social media in the local language as well. You've mentioned quite a lot about um, the payment methods as well and getting that right. That seems quite important as well as selling in the different currencies and the challenges there may be around that in actually, you know, setting up the bank accounts and uh, who, who is taking the charge uh, for, for translating the currencies back into uh, sterling from there. The good things that um, we talked about there is really that, you know, do get the multilingual staff, do take it um, uh, step by step. And also, I like Neil's comment right at the end, you know, about just stepping back and looking at it from somebody else's point of view can actually be really, really helpful. It's actually quite a simple thing to do. Um, you've mentioned also to get the support from uh, UKTI, UK Trade and Investment, things like market research, uh, going to MC events, and um, having reviews of uh, communications can all be very helpful. So I think I'll pass back now for questions. Hi, this is uh, Gemma's colleague Matthew, who's just been moderating the questions. Um, as Gemma says, we've had hundreds, but I've tried to pick um, some of the um, sort of most widely asked ones. Um, uh, first off is a question um, from Patrick Egan and a few others um, about the approach to international pay-per-click and keywords um, to reach the relevant audience and how to make sure that you're um, optimised for SEO and you're not wasting money on, on, on pay-per-click. Um, Neil, did you want to explain a little bit about how you did your switch from AdWords and then back to natural SEO? Yeah, I mean, um, I can explain what we did wrong. It's uh, certainly uh, certainly uh, what cost us a bit at the front end. But uh, why I looked at the AdWords uh, when we launched in Germany was uh, I spoke to several German uh, SEO agencies and, and uh, the cost was... Uh, Quite prohibitive uh, compared, to, uh, compared to the UK. Um, we, we, we looked at AdWords. Um, we, with the help of a uh, translation service, we, we identified the keywords that we we wanted. Um, but the, the bottom line really was, uh, in that instance, that uh, the translation service wasn't good enough. Um, and, and, and at that point, you're, you're going gonna to cost yourself a fair bit. So, you know, my only warning there is that uh, as you're laying that stuff out, you, you really need to be very confident um, in your translator and also be confident that the website um, is in a position to, um, to, to convert. Uh, you need evidence of that. Uh, I wouldn't want to make that uh, move before I was 100% certain that, you know, your conversion rate is at least approximately where you'd want it to be. Yeah, and I think, Neve, you had a sim similar sort of experience when you went into Germany, didn't you? Like, for example, Travel Wrap wasn't um, uh, yeah. a recognised keyword, yeah. and it was actually, was it Poncho or? Poncho, much to my yeah. disgust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, yes, the Germans call them Ponchos. In fact, we've got a, a site in Germany, uh, not our own site, but somebody else selling online in Germany, and she does some assistance with these called Ponchos. Um, and um, so that's, that's, they didn't have a word for travel app, as they don't really in the UK, but they like to call them ponchos, which seems to be sort of, uh, you know, I envisage a very different product, but there we are. Um, so you just, when in Rome, you do as the Romans, I think as Neil would agree. Um, so AdWords, we've had our fingers so badly burnt that it's kind of been up to my wrists almost. I don't, AdWords, we don't do at all now. I don't know that's a good thing or not. Um, we do quite well with SEO organically. I think what helped us most with the whole geo targeting and SEO things going back to um, the, the UK TI services they do this um, the communications review which I think um, Anne Marie mentioned as well yeah. and that was that was a very prescriptive step by step 
what you need to do to get the basics right before you even think of going to the starting line um, sort of process. And I, I think that was the, the best the best tool we had um, to get the sort of SEO and the, the geotargeting and the domain names and all of those things sorted before we even before we even began to, to try and sell. Yeah, I mean, that, that communications review, uh, we, we uh, had a similar experience and very, very useful. Um, again, the, the local domain names which you just touched on there, uh, a useful tool. That's still still um, to the prime uh, real estate on, on the organic side of things. Um, you, you need to have that bit right. Uh, but I can't recommend enough the uh, communications review. It's a, a simple enough process and you'll get a lot from it. Yeah, absolutely. Very good return on investment, that one, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. A um, couple more questions if we've got um, time. So um, the next one up was from Nigel. It was about trademarks. Um, and he was really asking, I guess, sort of um, what can you do to protect yourself um, if you don't have um, uh, trademarks in some of the countries that you're selling into? And worse, if there's um, other businesses that potentially have um, conflicting mm -hmm. trademarks. Mm -hmm. Are any of you trademarks? Yeah, we're trademarked um, at Labels for Kids. It's really difficult, even if you are trademarked, mm. you really got to fight a legal battle if anyone else is going to have the same name or, you know, what we found in some countries, you can't actually get the trademark. Like, for example, in Australia, you can't get the trademark unless you have a registered office that tr operates there. Um, so then you, we have the same in South Africa. Then you find somebody else has taken your, suddenly taken your domain name. Um, mm. <laughs> And even if they were starting to, you know, we've seen people using our name in other countries. But even if you have the trademark thing, you know, you, you either have to buy like a global one, which would be extortionate, or you would have to buy, we bought a European one, which was a start because we knew we wanted to target Europe. Um, and we bought a UK one. Um, but that was expensive enough. And then even then, you know, we see other countries popping up with <laughs> using our name in other countries. So either that or they use our, key, our name as a keyword in their optimization and their AdWords as well. I, mean, I think it's worth having at least in your own country and I think a European one would be worth investing in if you're targeting Europe but if you want to go further abroad you need to be very sure that you specifically want to target that country before you go out and get the trademark and you may find you need a registered office or you have to do it through a solicitor but again UKTI could give advice I think on that. Yeah. If you if you do find that your domains uh, internationally are being like cyber squatted and not being used for, for the purpose, um, there is an international domain name resolution process, bit of a mouthful, um, that you can go through. But again, if there's a strict process that needs to be followed and you probably mm -hmm. would need a solicitor to, to help you with that. Um, next question is an interesting one. So I guess we've been talking a lot about um, sort of direct-to-consumer um, sort of offers. I had a question from Cara um, about sort of B2B where their main customers are distributors, wholesalers in other um, markets. Um, if, um, aside from translating your site, is there anything else um, you'd recommend that might be slightly different for a company looking to uh, effectively find those kind of customers, that slightly different type of customer base? Yeah, I mean, one of the quickest ways to actually optimize your website into the local search uh, engines around the world is actually to work with your, you know, distributors or wholesalers or even if they're online retailers or stockists, whoever it is, your partners in that country and help them to optimize their website. Because, um, like I was saying, you know, in the UK, we actually are quite advanced in uh, sort of running websites and e-commerce, even though it doesn't feel like it sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, if we take that to those markets and that, that uh, know-how to those markets, we can actually um, get a bit of a competitive advantage. So that's one way of doing it. Anybody else had any other experiences? I haven't had an experience of that, Sarah, no. 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 So that would probably be yeah, my my best advice. Isn't there something very simple you can do, Sarah, for okay, you, Sarah. marketing in different countries? Um, in, in what, sorry? If there's something very simple you can do to inform Google that you are in, you know, Germany, um, so that they they can see you um, in the organic listings. Isn't there there's, there's something? Very yeah, simple. that's using the uh, geotargeting tool yeah. that you may find within uh, Google and Bing. Yes, exactly. You, you can actually do that if you set up parts of your website targeted um, at different parts of um, the world. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, next question, and this has come from Alison quite a few, it is about how much of the site to translate um, and when? All of it. <laughs> 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 I 
and then watch because you'll start getting phone calls in that language and they'll ring you and they'll expect uh, you to answer in that language as well. Um, no, all of all of it, obviously, yeah. I mean, I think from an optimization point of view, as soon as, if, you know yourself, if you go on a foreign site, if you went on a Swedish site for booking a holiday or something, it's all in Swedish, and there's maybe one homepage only in English, then you, you sort of get turned off. <laughs> you need to have it all. I think they prefer to buy from people where they think they're local and there's not going to be problems if they have any return issues, that they're going to be able to talk to somebody, pick up the phone. But it's mainly, I would say, if you have to pick anything, homepage, contact details, so they can get in touch with you in either by phone, by email, or, or you know, in, in live chat, like we have, any, any way they can in their own language, um, because that's the main thing. But I think you really need all of it done. It helps with SEO, doesn't it? Um, yeah. I don't know if Sarah would agree with me, but I think to start with, when we did our, well, work through our ECR, um, then we, we did the homepage and the contacts, as Anne Marie said, to start with, and some just to get going with, because it's, you know, it's a lot to take on at once to translate a whole site. Um, and then, and then absolutely all of it needs to be translated to make it, to make it convert to, to, at all, I think. And what you find hard with that is, I don't know about you guys, but you find it difficult then with the banking side of things, mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, once they connect to the bank, that that's all in the right languages as well, because you can find the bank, the bank or the developers can set that up wrong and click the wrong button. And suddenly when they convert to, you know, whether it swaps over to the bank to complete the purchase, it then goes into your English, for example, and they'll come straight off and then you'll have a big abandonment problem there. I do, I do agree. I think it's as, as much as you possibly can. Again, I suppose it really depends on your, your budget at the time. And um, often, if it's a, a, a new a new venture as such, that uh, you're going to want to be a little bit cautious. So I, I guess at that point, you would try and uh, translate the, the, the key pages. The bank is uh, is a very good point. That's one you do need to have um, as tight as you can get it. Um, but your home page, your category pages, I would suggest URLs are, are quite uh, good to have those translated. Um, and if you've got a massive product range, then the bits that you would do slowly by surely, uh, slowly but surely will be the, the product pages, uh, obviously starting with the mm -hmm. most popular products. But uh, you, know, you, you can go as far as you can with the budget you've got, and as you see the results, then, then keep translating. Uh, I, I think also if you're going to do what you say, Neil is correct, and I think if you if you have a big website like we do with lots of different products, mm -hmm. um, it may be worth just targeting, as you say, the popular products and just yeah. release like a German site, for example, with four pages or something. It's, it's definitely an option, yeah, definitely an option. Although if 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 you've got um, sort of a whole lots and lots of categories, maybe just uh, translate the category pages, um, the, the, the main descriptions there, because they're still going to get picked up uh, by Google in the local in, in the local countries. So you can see if you're getting visitors to those categories, and, and that might give you the prompt that that you know, may be the thing to translate next, even though you, you hadn't initially thought so. Did you two do the um, the different? Parallel websites before the different currencies. Do you think one the currency should the you know three different currencies, for example, should come before you start translating websites or alongside? We did a parallel, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think you. Uh, yeah, I think you need to have the currencies. Uh, yeah. Currencies there. Yeah. True. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks, guys. Um, some really interesting insight in all of that session, as I'm sure you will agree. Um, I think we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. I know that we had so many more questions come through, um, but we're just up against the clock, I'm afraid, and we are out of time. Uh, we will make sure that all of the questions are answered offline, um, so if we haven't managed to get to yours, do keep an eye on your email inbox for a full and detailed response. Now, this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, um, youtube.com forward slash open to export in the next 24 to 48 hours. We will email around the link and a notification as soon as that recording's gone live. And just a reminder to everyone that this was only the second in a series of three. So in two weeks time, we're going to do it all again, this time focusing on payments, fulfillment, logistics and operations. If you've auto enrolled, you need to take no action. We'll send you your registration details a little bit closer to the time. If you haven't auto enrolled, I encourage you to pop along to opentoexport.com and get yourself signed up. So just before I close the session, I just want to thank Sarah and thank Neve. 
uh, and Marie and Neil for your time today, sharing your expertise for the benefit of the community. Um, I'll make sure that the details of your website are circulated to our attendees, and I'd encourage you all to pop along and check out their sites as well. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to end it there and hope to see you on the next session. Thank you. Goodbye.